I'm glad to be here. This is going to be an exciting session. I think that, uh, um, uh, first of all, uh, Tori Bruno is a very interesting individual, uh, but, but uh, United Launch Alliance is going places they've never been before. So the title of this is uh, Kuiper and Beyond with Tori Bruno. It's going to be a very interesting session. How are you, Tori? I'm doing great, Ken. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you, my friend. Okay, so let me just, as a, as a point of introduction, uh, Tori Bruno is the president, chief executive officer of United Launch Alliance. In this role, of course, he serves uh, as the principal strategic leader uh, for the business. He also oversees all business management and operations. I think uh, most of us know that before joining ULA, he served as a vice president and general manager of Lockheed Martin's strategic missile defense. Pretty significant responsibility. He had a variety of other positions at Lockheed Martin. Um, he's, he's well known along the industry. Uh, with respect to uh, his expertise and thought leadership. He is a, an American Institute of Aeronautics and, and Astronautics Fellow, which is a companion of the Naval Order of the United States. He's a member of the Navy League, former member of the Board of Directors of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Perhaps most interesting, and Tori, I have to admit in all my discussions with you, I didn't know this, uh, he's the author of two books that explore the organization of the medieval Knights Templar from the perspective of modern business management. Uh, Templar organization, the management of warrior monasticism, and Templar Incorporated. How interesting is that? Uh, so, so, so I, you know, you, you have to, when did you have time to write a couple of books, Tori? I mean, I, that's, I, what is going on there? Well, it's back when I was developing the Thad Missile Defense Interceptor, but I have to say that I am impressed with your staff support to have found out all that stuff. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to have to go on Amazon online or something, see if I can find those books and, uh, and check that out. Hey, so, so the obvious question uh, with respect to Kuiper, you know, you've, yet, you've led uh, ULA, uh, which is in a, in a terrific way. I mean, it's primarily uh, launching government payloads, uh, but now you, you announced this huge win where you're gonna be the uh, launch vehicle uh, for Amazon's Kuiper constellation. Uh, speak to that and, and how, did you, how did you successfully navigate the penetration of this commercial adjacency in, in, in such, such a remarkable way? I just can't wait to, to hear you speak about that. Well, you know, truly it began with a massive restructuring and transformation of our company. As you pointed out, most of the national security assets on orbit today were put there by ULA, and that had been ULA's primary role for many, many years. But as the launch industry grew up and matured, and it was possible to have more than one domestic source and competition was now on the scene, which is healthy, it's good for industry, and it's good for the government and the taxpayer, ULA was in position for that. We were basically an extension of the Air Force. So the first thing I did was completely transform this company without breaking our perfect mission success record. People often ask me, what kept you up at night? That was the thing. And after that transformation, we have a rocket that's about to fly that is extremely versatile, designed for the high energy orbits that only the government truly needs but able to be a dial a rocket architecture that reaches down into that commercial Leo space. And yes, we are, are tremendously excited and honored by Amazon to have been selected as this primary launcher for Kuiper, the largest commercial space contract ever in history, the largest launch contract of any kind ever. <laughs> so, yeah, fantastic. So um, when competition entered your business space. Okay. You transformed the company. Um, that's obviously an organization, a cultural transformation. It touched all of those different things. Um, you could speak to that. I'd be interested in that, but also uh, what types of cool new technologies did that transformation drive you to introduce and, and create? Did, uh, did, did you have a, a technology domain transformation uh, that was part of that? Yes, we did. You know, what everyone knows about is our need to retire the venerable RD-180 rocket engine that powered Atlas that our government asked us to do to keep Russian rocket scientists from wandering off to North Korea and Iran and China. But it was so much more than that. This is a giant, very capable, high energy vehicle. Our single core Vulcan replaces the heavy launch vehicle Delta IV, which is literally three rockets bolted together. And the real interesting part about it is its upper stage. 
You know, most upper stages are used to go to Leo, a 15 minute ride to space. This thing is designed for 12 hours of operation in space, and we will be extending it far beyond that to many days in space. That allows us to do these very complicated maneuvers in insertions and really start looking at what the Pentagon will need in the future to cope with this Chinese threat that we now face in orbit. And so the launch, this launch landscape is, is the market landscape's changing, okay? Um, uh, it, it, it looked, you know, I, I would have guessed that the, that the launch vehicle market is increasing globally. I went to some things uh, uh, recently where there were 120, 130 uh, launch providers that were in play in the competitive market space. Uh, uh, but yet, uh, some of the recent dialogue is it's not increasing. It's actually, the, the market looks like it's decreasing. Where do you see the market heading? What's your perspective, Lori, as an insider? Yeah, there's two really interesting things happening in the launch market. You know, the first was this, this blooming up of what we call micro launchers. We're a heavy launch company or a medium to end heavy launch company. But there was an idea that we're going to build these small rockets and they're so much less expensive than a large rocket. And we'll be there to fly these thousands of uh, mega constellation satellites. that's going to create this high bandwidth internet in the sky. And we'll be flying them one at a time or two at a time. When we looked at that several years ago, as you say, there were as many as 150, 200 companies registered. There were today, there were recently probably as many as a dozen actually building things that are or might soon be flying. But our assessment was no, that's a completely wrong view of the marketplace. The physics dictate that although that launch vehicle is itself less expensive, it's dollars per kilogram to orbit is 10 to 100 times higher than a large launch vehicle in a heavy class. And you can't undo that. That's just how it works. And that these constellations, because of their very large numbers, would be on heavy launch vehicles. And in where we sit today, that's the case. They are all going up on that kind of vehicle, as we predicted, as I said, on many panels over the years. So we've seen that group of providers really collapse. There's so very few of them left now. I think there's room for probably one or two in the marketplace in the future doing demos, experiments, specialty missions like that. And so that's a big shift. And as they began to grow and then these missions migrated off, we just saw their market fall away. And that's why it's taking the companies with them. The other you know, thing that has been really a big major sea state change in this industry is this complete reversal from an environment where we had so many nation states with multiple launch vehicles that viewed access to space as a strategic sovereign imperative. And the net result of that was a chronic oversupply of launch vehicles or, or of lift. And overnight that has completely turned upside down. And as we sit here today, there's actually a scarcity of lift globally. There are not enough providers of the medium and heavy class launch vehicles to support that market. So basically, it's pretty it's pretty simple analysis. What you're saying is it's cheaper to ride a bus than it is to drive a, your own personal car. So if you're proliferating a large number of LEO satellites in a constellation, uh, buy a ticket on the bus uh, and, uh, uh, and that's your best ride. That's your cheapest ride. You've got it. The number one economic driver for mega constellations is dollars per spacecraft on orbit, which favors the bus, as you say, the freight train. So then, given the competitive playing field seems to be narrowing, okay, um, how is UL ULA positioning itself in this competitive landscape? You've got uh, launch timelines, you've got uh, you know, cost per kilogram. Uh, what are the other attributes? Probably trust. I mean, you're going to spend money. A satellite providers are going to spend a lot of money creating satellite constellations. They want the launch reliability to be really high. I mean, what are the attributes that you look at across the competitive landscape and how are uh, you positioning ULA to, to compete effectively in that space? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with reliability because you brought that up. You know, we are at 154 now. We have that's 154 launches, 154 successes. We've never failed to get our payload up to space. That's an unprecedented reliability record. It's important, obviously, for billion dollar, one of a kind national security assets, but even in the PLEO market, 
where we have tiny spacecraft that are far less expensive, and we may not initially think of it that way. Back to the bus analogy, it's a bus full of those. There are dozens and dozens of those spacecraft on any given lift, and so it becomes a valuable lift. There's also a time element to that. When you're establishing your first constellation, you've got to get 2,000, 3,000 satellites up. The majority of that has to be in place before it's truly effectively revenue generating. So there's an urgency to do it. So that drives you to these large quantities. You're not going to back off. But it also takes you to something else we do, which is to provide a very high reliability of launching on time. You know, one of the things that uh, the casual observer doesn't know about because they only tune into a launch, you know, the day of the launch, or they only become aware of it a couple of days ahead of time, is that launches are typically ordered a couple of years ahead of time. And so being able to take that order for someone's long-term business plan and launch them on that day or within a couple of days of that day is a pretty big and important thing for their economics. And we happen to have the best on-time launch record as well. And then the last thing I would probably talk about is exactly what you hit on. Built into the culture here is transparency. You know, we really are completely open with our customers because we know how important this is to them. You know, when you're a, a launch provider, you build rockets and it's easy, I think, to get distracted by the rocket because that's your whole world. But the rocket has no purpose without a payload on top. And you really need to respect that and own it and put yourself in the, you know, in the shoes of your customer every day. That is an interesting uh, uh, business philosophy that I have discovered in my experience to be enormously valuable. It's very easy to get focused on what we're building and what we're doing. And, you know, I come at this a lot of times from a satellite communications, mobile networking perspective. It's easy to get caught up in the technology about how we can do more bits per second or we can do more of this or that. And in reality, it's about the customer experience. And it's about creating a customer outcome that is superior to, the, to their alternatives. That's what you can monetize that aspect of it. That's what grows your business. It's about focusing on that customer. I couldn't agree with you more. So in, in, in light of that, let's talk about the customer. Mega constellations, uh, especially at Leo, they have to think about interweaving replacement satellites uh, into the string of pearls, whether it's in orbital plane A or orbital plane B, or however they're, uh, however they have to deal with that. We all know that Leos have a relatively short life of three to five years, so we're replacing those all the time. How, as a launch provider, are you? bringing your customer focus on that problem and, and supporting the need for a replacement of, of the constellation on a, on a really an enduring basis. Yeah, well, you know, once again, one of the, the keys to being successful in this business because it's such a long cycle is to guess right. <laughs> You're always looking into the future. And so we guessed right that mega constellations need to go up on heavy launch vehicles, not micro launchers. The other thing that we imagined when we looked at that self same set of economics was that it would not make sense to replace spacecraft on orbit once the constellation is established one at a time as they died. The economic advantage is in just lifting a few more in that heavy launch vehicle when you initially establish the constellation. And we're seeing that play out now in the marketplace. The typical uh, PLEO operator will put up around 10% spares when they establish their initial shells. So that again is favoring the heavy launch vehicle uh, capability. So it's, you know, it's turned out that way. And in terms of the, the other thing that I think your question touches on that's worth understanding is this is you know, a, a constellation of satellites providing, you know, high quality, high performance broadband support. It's just like the internet in your home. It's not a 10 year life cycle for the spacecraft and for the technology that's on it. They are deliberately designed to have a short lifespan so that they are constantly refreshing the technology. And how that translates into the launch marketplace and the launch provider is it's not what you might naturally imagine, which is a big rush to put up, you know, 3,000, 10,000 satellites, and then a big lull where there's nothing until the age out, and then you do it again. 
It's more like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You paint from one shore to the next, and then you turn around and you paint back. It's just like that. The launch rate continues steady state at this very high tempo that we, of course, now ULA are growing into for Kuiper. And that keeps the technology fresh, and it continues that, uh, that sustainment that keeps the launch provider healthy. Okay, so given the relatively short life of some of these satellites, um, there's been a lot of debate among big players that are uh, uh, perhaps emotionally as well as uh, technically uh, arguing with each other about the threat of space debris, the, uh, the, the clutter of satellites at LEO, the clutter of debris as they deorbit and fail, the clutter of you know, all of that and, and the threats that that pose uh, to us in so many ways. Are, are you concerned as a launch provider uh, about flying through uh, these constellations, fly, you know, mega constellations flying through space debris how do you how do you manage that problem how do you manage that risk but both for you and your and your customers yeah absolutely that's important to us i want to start by saying we want these mega constellations they are going to bring internet in high performance to places that don't have it now to places that are underserved it's not just about us in the developed world or us in the cities in america it's about everybody and it's more than just internet service. If you're in a place in the, on this planet where you don't enjoy democracy the way we do, information is freedom because you have to be free in the mind before you can be free in your society. So it's very, very important. They are a different animal entirely. These constellations exist in thin, physically dense shells. It does impact how we go to space as a launch provider. If you're going to a higher orbit, a high energy orbit, we like to call them, you punch right through the short dimension of these shells and it has very little impact on us. But if you're going to a low earth orbit that is just above a shell, you sweep through it in a big arc, you spend a lot of time inside it, and it significantly reduces your launch opportunities to do that without running into someone or literally having what we call a collision or a conjunction. Now, this can be managed. And I have spoken on this several times. There are a set of norms of behaviors that are eminently logical and allow us to enjoy the benefits of these while not losing our access to space. I'll also say that there's a business opportunity here too. You know, as we put all kinds of capabilities on our upper stage, which I've only hinted at, and I'm afraid I can't do a lot more than that today, um, that is a marketplace that's going to exist where we're, we're not going to just leave this material in space when it ends its useful life. It's going to go up, be captured, be deorbited or repurposed in space. And there's a great through space transportation environment that's going to happen to support all of that. Okay, so you're touching on the geopolitical situation. You're touching on some maybe special capabilities as a DOD uh, launch provider uh, that you may have. Uh, our adversaries, maybe China and Russia, they're rapidly developing their in-space capabilities. In some cases, they might play by a different set of rules or play by no rules as, as far as we're concerned. So, so how, is, how are you and ULA uh, working to advance national space capabilities at a national level? Can you speak to that in some, in some high level? You touched well, on it. You brought it up. You brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> At some high level. <laughs> so I will say that uh, the entire region between low Earth orbit and cislunar space, all the way out to the moon, is going to become vitally important to our country and to our allies, both for national security because of how important space is to us and how those regions can be used to support the peace or harm the peace. And it becomes very much more about an environment where we don't just go to space and drop something off, but where there needs to be logistical support for what's there, where there needs to be, uh, you know, maneuver, where there needs to be through space transportation. And by the same token, it's also a tremendous opportunity economically for our nation. There is a multi-trillion dollar a year economy in cislunar space just waiting for us to develop it. And that's something that I've talked quite a bit about and I have my eye on all the time as we lay out our technology roadmaps and our capabilities to go out and make that possible. 
where we are not just protecting space and keeping it peaceful. We are making it a vibrant new economic zone. And by the way, we're also changing our human destiny. Because as we sit here on the planet right now, Ken, you know, we are consuming fixed resources here on Earth. And we put a lot of energy into trying to figure out how to live smaller lives, to have a, a tinier footprint, all the while knowing that that is just slowing down the inevitable exhaustion of our resources and the collapse of our civilization at some point in the future. Well, right there, right there, like a week from where we are sitting right now, are unimaginable resources that will literally change that into a post-scarcity human future where we are living beyond this planet and no longer looking into this ever-shrinking world and future for our children, our grandchildren, and so on. It's a bright future, and uh, we're working on those technologies, too. <laughs> so, so you're attentive to sustainability, you're attentive to ESG. Um, uh, so let, let's, let's move to STEM, okay? I mean, uh, a STEM workforce is vital, science, technology, engineering, and math. A STEM workforce is really vital to maintain our edge uh, over our adversaries to feed, to give the talent pipeline to feed this, this endeavor, okay? Uh, that you're, that you're this trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar cislunar economy, economic zone that you talked about. How is ULA investing in students and its workforce, women in engineering, things like that? Tell me, tell me what you're doing specifically uh, at ULA to to, to uh, accelerate the pipeline. Oh my gosh, so much outreach. I spend a significant amount of my time during the session when universities are in session and high schools are in session, traveling around the country. If I'm at one of my factories, I'll take time to go out and visit a university and encourage students about this wonderful future that they can make happen, that they can live in space and, and bring about this, this future that we all want to have. We also have a great, robust intern program. I hire as many interns every year as the law will allow. We give them real work to do. We pay them. I don't believe in unpaid internships. I hope I'm not offending anybody, but an internship is useless unless it's real work. And if it's real work, you ought to be paid for it. We're into the high schools. We're into the K through 12 because we've also learned from the studies that if you don't introduce an interest, a young person in STEM, in the K through 12 window, you're probably not gonna get them into a STEM program in university and pull them through to the other side. And diversity is so important to us and everyone in industry. You get better ideas and more creativity and better innovation when you have a diverse team and we're short. We don't have enough STEM workers for this future. Why would we not try and absolutely maximize everyone we can? Amen to that. Amen. And as a father of, uh, of, of little girls, uh, as well as big boy, I got, I got, I got a number of kids and all of that. And I'll tell you what, this technology field is so fantastic. Uh, and I'm glad to see you doing that. Listen, I got one more question uh, before we kind of get to the end of our time slot. Uh, uh, I've been following you on Twitter. It looks like you're making good progress on the first Vulcan. So um, where is ULA on the Vulcan development? When will the first launch be scheduled to for, and I, and, uh, and I, and I, I hope that it's not that kindergarten and elementary school engineer that's going to contribute to the Vulcan's first launch. I hope it comes sooner than that. Where, where are you on that? And then, uh, and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll move on. Yeah, I've got a booster in the factory. I got two engines, which it takes two, hanging on the back, just going through its final assembly and test. The upper stage is in the same state. We're going to have that uh, whole vehicle on our on our rocket ship, we call it. It's our custom ship that takes them out to the Cape because they're too big. You can't transport them on the road. You can't even attach them together because it's 30 stories tall. We'll have that going out to the Cape before the end of the year and we'll be testing on the pad, waiting for our payload. I expect to fly in Q1 of next year. Like we said before, there's no point in going to space without a payload if you can possibly avoid that. I do have to fly sooner or later because it's also a certification flight for government missions, but I will wait as long for my payload as I can. My payload is doing great. It is a commercial lunar lander to the moon, first commercial mission like that ever by Astrobotics in Pennsylvania. And they, it is their first spacecraft. They're doing fine. It's just taking them a little longer, so I'm going to wait on them. And uh, my other customer, Amazon, as an opportunity to put a couple of demo spacecraft to check out their crosslinks and their technology and all of that sort of thing. 
And when they saw us with that window of time, they asked if we could, uh, you know, make space for them in the back seat, and we have. So Q1 in 23 is when we're going to fly, if not sooner. Watch that space. And I'll add one more thing to the STEM thing since you brought up your girls. I have personally done my part. I have a son and a daughter. They are both engineers. They are both rocket scientists. And since I only had one daughter, she had to get two engineering degrees. <laughs> well, good for you. God bless you. Listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Tori. I, wanted, I, I, I do have to give you a heads up. We're out of time. I'm going to toss it back in a minute to Scott and to Cody or Scott and David. Depends on who's man the, the, uh, the control center there. But uh, uh, I, do want to, I do want to give you a heads up that I've got Swami Iyer up next. This is, a, this is a double header for me. I got Swami coming up next. He'll give his perspective on some of these same questions.